Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that's counting the votes and he's using the old one for you, two for me system. Here is the very reliable, trustworthy captain. Yeah, the votes are in. There will be no president, only captains. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring I-70 Colorado Lager by the good people of Odyssey Beer Works. This is not your typical lager. It's delicious and refreshing, just like what you would expect from a traditional lager. But this one is a little more well-traveled, and life's an odyssey, not a destination. Garage grade three and a half bottle caps out of five. And let's give some cheers to some of our non-traditional and well-traveled friends. First up, cheers to Troy and Provo, Utah. And a shout out to Danielle in Townsville, Australia. Next up, we have a cheers to Linda in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And a big we like your jib to Katie in Madison, Wisconsin. Next up, Captain, we have Rachel in Parts Unknown. She is the proud owner of a Feeling Fami shirt and part of the Ban the Van movement. And last but certainly not least, we have Leslie in Odessa, Texas. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and helped us out with this week's beer fun. Yeah, B W W R U N beer run. For everything True Crime Garage, check out our website, truecrimegarage.com. If you're looking for our old episodes, download the Stitcher app. It is free. And we have a bonus show called Off the Record, and that's on Stitcher Premium. And if you're wondering about the presidential counts and parts unknown, well, the winner and still champion is old Fami Malik. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. In the psychedelic jazz rock song, Riders on the Storm, Jim Morrison and the Doors warned us that there's a killer on the road. Starting in the 1950s, Americans eagerly built the planet's largest public work, the 42,795-mile national system of interstate and highways. Before the concrete was dry, a specter began hunting. The road and his means of travel are very much an important and necessary part of his arsenal. The nation's murder rate shot up as its expressways were built. America became more violent and more mobile at the same time. These killers and what we call them mostly depends on his methods of murder, his victims, and how he chooses his attack. There's the hitcher, the freeway killer, the long haul killer. There was Norris and Bitteker cruising around Southern California in a windowless van that they nicknamed Murder Mac. There was Starkweather, the hot-rotting juvenile delinquent who led the National Guard on a multi-state manhunt in which the killing of 11 people inspired two indelible pieces of American art, Bruce Springsteen's song Nebraska and Terrence Malick's film Badlands. There was the Call Me God DC sniper attacks of 2002, where long-distance serial killers positioned the barrel of their Bushmaster XM-15 rifle through a hole cut at the rear of a Chevy Caprice to pick off their prey. And there was the I-5 killer, a true crime story told here in the garage in episodes 313 and 314 back in June of 2019. The story of a homicidal sexual predator with an appetite for unspeakable acts of violence. Law enforcement faced the awesome challenge of catching a suspect responsible for committing such ugly crimes. Crimes that filled every woman within his striking range with horror. Unfortunately, 
His striking range was Interstate 5 and its tentacles spanning over 1,300 miles in three states, California, Oregon, and Washington, leaving a trail of victims along the way. This week, we tell the true crime story of an unidentified serial killer. A story that at times will share similarities with some of the atrocities previously mentioned. 20 years after Jim Morrison prognosticated that there's a killer on the road, this killer hit the pavement. This serial killer used the interstate system as a hunting ground. This is a story of a white-knuckled monster seething behind the wheel, eager to make his appointment. But as he's driving the interstate, what is driving him to kill? He's a dealer of motiveless murder, a predator with deadly accuracy, a coward who killed seemingly just to kill, and then vanished into the world. He disappeared and remains unidentified. We have no caged monster to point to and say that, that did this. Instead, we only have a moniker, the I-70 killer. This is True Crime Garage. Interstate 70 or I-70 is a major east-west interstate highway in the United States that runs from Utah to Baltimore, Maryland. I-70 approximately traces the path of old U.S. Route 40 east of the Rocky Mountains, and it runs through or near many major cities including Denver, Topeka, Kansas City, St. Louis, Indianapolis, Columbus, Pittsburgh, and Baltimore. I-70 is 2,151 miles long, and some of those major cities that we just mentioned will be important to this week's case, especially Indianapolis, Indiana, where we will start off. This takes place on Wednesday, April 8, 1992. We have 26-year-old Robin Folder. She's working. She's going to be helping out a friend at work. The friend was not feeling well, and Robin told the co-worker, Hey, no problem. I can come in and cover your shift today. Robin worked at the Payless Shoe Source on the east end of Indianapolis, Indiana. She was one of only two full-time workers at this location. Now, there were a couple of part-time workers there as well, but not on this day. Robin was a manager. Payless is an international discount footwear chain that has been around for decades and I believe is still active today. Yeah, BOGO. There you go. Now, because this store was operating with a very small staff, this required that at times they run the store with just a single employee. And again, that will be the situation on this Wednesday. This made some of the employees uncomfortable. The store did not have a lot of problems or issues, but did experience shoplifting on occasion, as most stores do. This store does not have any security cameras. And at the time, the only real security measure was a buzzer that would go off when the front door was open, notifying staff that someone has either entered or exited the store. Robin, in particular, did not like being alone in the store at nighttime. And her sister would often drive to the store and kind of just hang out with Robin during her solo night shifts. But our case is going to start out on this Wednesday afternoon. Robin working alone. Now, next door to the Payless is a Speedway gas station that is still there to this day. A lady named Lucretia, she's working at the Speedway. She gets a phone call from the district manager of the Payless store, who says, hey, I've been trying for about 45 minutes to get in touch with my employee Robin at the Payless. I've tried numerous times and no one is answering the phone. Could you go next door and make sure that she's all right? Lucretia goes next door and she enters the shoe store. She does not see Robin. In fact, she does not see anyone at all. What she does see is an open cash register. Now she works at a gas station, so she's very aware of what this could mean. 
So this is enough for Lucretia. Yeah, this means trouble. She leaves the store, goes back to the Speedway, and calls the police saying she thinks that the Payless has been robbed or possibly a robbery in progress. This, of course, is going to trigger a speedy response. Officers arrive on the scene, and they are in the store at 2.21 p.m. They find Robin dead on arrival. She was located in the back of the store in a stock room. Police theorize that the killer took Robin to the back of the store either just before or after removing money from the register. Marion County conducted the autopsy, and the info released to the public at the time was that Robin was shot twice. The shots were to the right side of her head, in the back of the head, and fired at, quote, a reasonably close range and from a small caliber gun. Robin's purse and coat were found in the store, and her car found parked outside. So, Police pointed out that this made the robbery angle and motive a little strange. They felt that if somebody came in there and the sole purpose of the attack was for robbery and it resulted in murder, that this individual would have taken just about everything they could get their hands on. And it doesn't appear that they did that, not just because of her purse. Maybe, Maybe it's as simple as they didn't see her purse, but... What we do know is there was $50 left in the register. So police were very upfront about this here, Captain, stating this is not a store that they would expect a robbery to take place. It's not a store that's going to have a lot of cash on hand, not a great target for a robbery. And then to top that off, they find $50 left in the register. Yeah, but there's been several people, especially like, people that rob banks often where they talk about you go in. The main thing is to have a location that that, that there's no security. Mm -hmm. You might only get a couple hundred bucks, but your risk of getting caught is so low that you can. Now you just have to duplicate that over and over again. Right. I guess the thing that makes this one extra tricky is the murder that's involved. Right. Why not? As you just pointed out perfectly, the security level at this store is terrible. There, There is none. We have a single female working by herself that day. There's no cameras. And it's fairly quick that you can get back on a speedy route out of town as soon as you hit this store. The murder makes it weird. And then I want to talk about the $50 left in the register real quick. We've, we've discussed this on other robbery homicides in the past. And one thing that's tricky here is we don't know the details of why $50 was left. Was this something that the killer chose to do or did unwillingly did not know that they did this. Sometimes you keep the larger bills underneath. Right. And maybe it was just overlooked. He didn't check there. Yeah. Maybe it was wrapped up in a rubber band. Maybe it was taped. And we, we never hear of, you know, there was, $51 $51 and 79 cents left in the register. Cause I always wonder about that. I'm like, I can't imagine the person taking the time to scoop all the coins out of the register as well. I doubt they had exactly $50 in coins in this right. register. But the thing is, again, if the sole purpose of this attack is in fact robbery, usually the perpetrator will have or force the employee to assist them in some manner in the robbery, meaning tell me where all the money is. Show me, is there a safe? You know, is there any money that that's, you've not told me about? So usually they're good about getting all of the cash that they can because they are threatening the employee to help them figure out where all the money is. Right. But then as far as law enforcement goes or a detective goes, you go, okay, well, Maybe the robber just didn't know that there wouldn't be that much money in a store like that. So maybe they're not like a highly sophisticated robber. Mm -hmm. But the murder makes you believe that the person knew the person working at the store, the victim. Right. Because what we have here is a situation where the murder seems unnecessary for the purpose of robbery. You could have went in there if this person does not know you 
boom, you stick a gun in the face. Show me where all the money is. Okay, I got the money. I'm out. I'm in my car. I'm heading towards the freeway. No murder necessary. Right. Show me the money. The timeline, I think, here is interesting. Let's go through this real quick, too. So we have the police who said in the papers immediately that they were looking for persons who had been in the store that day to come forward. Maybe they had seen something or heard something of importance, whether or not they knew it. So anybody that shopped at that store on that day, we want you to come forward and speak with us because you may have seen something that went down prior to this robbery and homicide. Yeah, no offense to Payless, but when I was a kid and you'd get Payless shoes, which happened several times, you would not want to admit to your friends that you had Payless shoes on. You would say maybe you got your shoes from Kmart or Walmart or anywhere other than Payless. What they really wanted, what police really wanted, Captain, was to speak with a customer involved in the last transaction, the last known transaction. So the last transaction was recorded on the register at 1.12 p.m. The purchase was for one pair of women's shoes and one pair of men's shoes. Police were on the scene at 2.21. This is the time that they say that they found Robin deceased. Right. This is after Lucretia went into the store and then called it in. Again, this is a robbery in progress call, so response time should be very quick and multiple units responding to the scene. Well, I wonder if if the last customer was like a ruse. I go in there, I act like a customer, I talk to them, I'm acting like I'm buying a pair of women's shoes, a pair of men's shoes. If I do that, you don't know what kind of customer I was. If I was a female or male, I'm getting to know knowledge of the layout, how many people were working. Because if I come in as a, a nice, respectable customer, Oh, yeah, you know, how do you like your job? Do you like working here? Uh, it's okay, but I, I don't like working by myself. Oh, you work by yourself. She rings up the order, and then that's when you turn on the person. And so then it doesn't matter that they saw you or talked to you because you know that you're going to murder them. That's interesting. And i tell you why. Because we actually have a very short period of time here when you piece everything together. We know we have the last transaction at 1.12 p.m. We have police on the scene at 2.21 p.m., so just a little more than an hour later, an hour, nine minutes, actually. Right, and it doesn't matter how much money you spend in the store because you're just taking them back anyways. And during that hour, nine minutes, we have several things that we knew took place, all right? We have Lucretia who went to the store, and then she calls police. So she finds the store empty, and the register open. Now, she does not go through the entirety of the store, but it's very likely that the store was empty mm-hmm. at that point. So let's back this up just a few minutes. If you back this thing up, let's say 10 minutes, 15 at the very most, between the time Lucretia shows up, police arrive on the scene. Now we're talking about less than an hour. And if you factor in the words of the manager who called Lucretia at the speedway and says, I've been trying to get a hold of Robin for 45 minutes and no one has answered the phone. So that means either Robin was attacked and killed very close to that last transaction per that 45 minutes. That now puts us at like 140 at the latest, or the attack is in progress when the calls first start taking place. Right. So a small window of time. That's key. But not only that, but... The location is going to be key here in this case as well. And the rest of the cases that we discuss, this pay less store is now one of those batteries, bulbs plus store. It's a standalone store located in a busy area of town. That's one thing when looking this up on the map that really struck me as bizarre. It seems like there would be a lot of activity in this area, foot traffic, people driving, There's a lot of um, fast food businesses in this area. So this store is located in a busy area, and right by the Payless is that speedway that we mentioned, Right. a paint store, and a car repair place. No, paint stores aren't that busy. But if you go just past, those are the immediate businesses. If you just go one business past all those, you have things like McDonald's, Taco Bell, 
places that you would expect to be busy even on a Wednesday afternoon. Taco Bell. Taco Bell. Mm -hmm. That might be dinner tonight. Paint store, car repair place. This Payless shoe source is at 7325 Pendleton Pike, Indianapolis, Indiana, just off of Interstate 70 on the east end of Indianapolis. It's just 6.9 miles from Interstate 70 via Interstate 465. Repeat that again. How many miles? It's about 6.9 miles from Interstate 70. That's still, that's still a distance, though. So, according to my maps, roughly a seven-minute drive from I-70. Now, there was a witness, but what he witnessed, well, everyone will need to decide the importance of what he saw. Mm -hmm. Jeff Mayrose, he's the manager of the MAB paint store, said that he saw a man in a green jacket walking down Pendleton Pike. He said the man carried a long bag. And Mayrose assumed that he was some type of hitchhiker or maybe a homeless person. He said that the man came from the direction of I-465, which intersects with I-73 miles south of the pike. The man in the green jacket stopped at Mayrose's store. I don't believe he went in. He repeatedly circled the building before sitting on the curb nearby. Mayrose said that the man remained there for about a half an hour, maybe more, staring at the Payless shoe source across the street and, you know, rummaging through his long bag that he carried. The man said Mayrose was mumbling, talking to himself, and even giggling at times. Mm -hmm. Mayrose reported the, I'm sorry, Mayrose reportedly said the man he saw was either on drugs or or he had mental problems. Did anybody get a look at any of the items in his long bag? No, I don't. There's no reference of that. Uh, What we do have is Jeff Mayrose, from his view, said that the strange man disappeared around 2 p.m., maybe a little earlier, maybe a little later. Mm -hmm. He did say that he caught a glimpse of the man calmly trying to hitch a ride going north, back to I-465. He's witnessing this man who's in the area, kind of behaving strangely, sitting in the parking lot of his paint store. He says, staring at the Payless across the street, man disappears for a little while, and then when he reappears, he sees him, he believes, trying to hitch a ride back north. Right, which, again, it's eyewitness report, so you got to take it a little bit with a grain of salt, but... The idea, too, that somebody's going to rob um, a shoe store, be in a green jacket with a long bag, and then decide to hitchhike after they robbed and murdered somebody. Seems a little odd, right? Seems extremely odd because I want to take this a step further. I keep Uh. hinting around the idea that the the robbery is less a part of this than than it may be. That the murder might be the actual motive here. And if that is, in fact, true, we don't know. But if it is, in fact, true, that means that this individual likely showed up to that area knowing their intent was to murder someone. And then, as you pointed out, how dumb would it be to say, oh, I have no way of getting out of here other than my own two feet or my giant thumb in the air trying to hitch a ride out of this area? I mean, right. if he doesn't successfully find a ride or if he can't haul ass out of there fast enough on his own two feet, he could still be standing there near the store when police arrive on the scene at 2.21 p.m. But like I told you, when I worked in Richmond, we had downtown Richmond, like the historic district is what they called it. There's multiple banks and we started getting robbed all the time, like all the different banks. Now, my, my bank never got robbed. They, they they were having a really hard time trying to catch the person because they were they're either showing up with a bicycle, leaving with a bicycle, or showing up on foot and leaving on foot. So they knew that the perpetrator had it, these different escape zones, but it was so much harder for them to catch. That's true, and this being a busy area with a lot of buildings, a lot of businesses, and a lot of times these businesses and buildings are going to back up to neighborhoods. Someone, I guess, could be out of there pretty quickly or at least uh, in an area where it'd be harder to track them down. Now, very sadly, Robin Folder was 
only 26 years old. She was a very kind soul. She was intelligent, hardworking, and a caring person, said her sister, Susan. Robin wanted more than anything to get married and start a family. Only 26 years old, Captain. Folder's family later complained to the Indianapolis Star about what they thought were numerous security lapses at the business. They carried their concerns to the Payless executives. In the end, the Indiana Department of Labor cleared the business of any wrongdoing. We should point out that the police have been fairly vocal that they believe if, in fact, this green jacket man was the perpetrator of this murder, they believe that he was sitting in the parking lot of the paint store watching the Payless Shoe Source store to determine how many employees were there. And if, in fact, this killer was seeking a female victim to look and confirm that it would be a solo female worker. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to all the people in the back. Now, three days later, April 11th, 1992, just three days later, we will have two more victims. This is Patricia Majors and Patricia Smith. Patricia Majors is 32 years old. She is the owner of the Le Bride de Elegance Bridal Shop located at 4613 East Kellogg in Wichita, Kansas. We're in a whole different state here, Captain. I was born in a different state. Patricia and her husband, Mark Majors, bought the store in February of 1991. So just uh, about two months earlier. He says the store was primarily for her, saying that she really enjoyed working with the customers and the bridal environment. It's important to note that the couple owned both the Lay Bride the Elegance Bridal Shop, and the Sir Knight Tuxedo and Formal Wear Shop. These were adjacent shops located at 4613 East Kellogg and 4609 East Kellogg. Well, and like you said, the first crime happened on a Wednesday. This is now a Saturday. A Saturday in April of 1992. We have Patricia Majors. She will be working with employee Patricia Smith. Her maiden name is Trendle. Patricia Smith is 23 years old, a nursing student at Wichita State with plans to eventually pursue pediatric care. She's a newlywed, married to Norman Smith for nine months by this point in our timeline. This was the only case, and there's going to be a series of these, the only case involving multiple victims. Investigators believe the killer was under the impression that there were there was only one woman in the store at the time. Normally, Patricia Majors was not in the store on a Saturday at this time. The women had stayed past the typical 6 o'clock closing time. So by the time that this takes place, Captain, the store should have been closed. But they stayed past the closing time because they were waiting on a male customer who had called ahead and arranged to pick up a cummerbund after hours. At some point after 6 p.m., police think that the women opened the door to a man who they thought was the customer that they were staying late for. Do we have a note about this customer? Do we know if we knew the name of the customer? We know exactly who he is, and, and we'll get into that. This is going off of police theory that the attacker arrives at the store. The women let him in thinking he's the customer they've been waiting on. Then the attacker ushers them to the back room of the bridal shop that served as a work area and office. And there the man shot both women in the back of the head with a 22 caliber semi-automatic firearm. The man did steal some cash from the register and walked away, but not before a brief confrontation 
with the actual customer who had made arrangements with the ladies to pick up this cummerbund after closing time. So he arrives at the store thinking he's just going to go in and pick up his cummerbund and be on his way, right? The actual customer arrived to pick up the cummerbund and encountered the killer. The killer let the man go, but this was only because the man refused to enter the store. The way that this goes down, and we do not have this man per se, his name and what he says exactly went down. We have the police statements and the police reports of what they say this man told them. It sounds like when he encountered the killer, the killer tried to get him to come into the store itself. Had he gone in, who knows what would have happened? I'm guessing he might have done the same with this guy. Dead man. Yes. He may have ushered him to the back room and killed him as well. The customer notified police once the killer left. So the way that this goes down, he does not go into the store. He flees the area. There is a discrepancy of when the call came in to police because it's going to be this customer that calls police and says, hey, something terrible is going on. Where's he calling from? That's what's difficult. Again, we don't have this man's name or his direct statements. We have what police say he told them. Right. There's a discrepancy of when he called. Most reports stay, say that it was over an hour prior to the police arriving. I I don't know. I don't love that that sentence. I think it's I think it's confusing. It sounds like he called something in and then police didn't bother showing up to the scene for an hour. Mm-hmm. It's very likely though that this customer did not know that the women were dead in the store. He, he could speculate that. But he wouldn't have seen them. He didn't enter the store. He has no way of knowing that there are two people who have been killed in the back of this store. But did he see a gun? Yes. Because he did if the see guy with the gun goes, get in the store, you first start off by going, hey, buddy with a gun, suck it. I'm not going in the store. <laughs> you're going to have to shoot me out here where there might be some eyewitnesses. Or better chance that you're going to miss. Do not insult the man with the gun. But here, here's the difficult thing. Well, but hold on. My point is better to insult him than to follow his directions. Regardless of how this went down, Captain, the thing that we can say, I believe for certain, is that there is some time that passes between when he encountered the killer and when the phone call was made and when police arrived on the scene. I don't know if that means that this man had to go find a pay phone. It's 1992. Right. Or if it was one of those things, sometimes look, when you walk into a situation that's terrifying, shocking, something you're not expecting, you don't necessarily behave rationally upon witnessing or experiencing that situation. This man may have just done what came naturally and got back in his car and drove home. And then made the call once he was home, once he had calmed down on the drive home and said, there's something going on here. I better make sure I report this. Or the fact that he might have had a wedding he was going to that night. It was a Saturday. He was needing his cummerbund. Correct. What if he was like, this thing just went down, but I got to make it to this wedding. I'm the best man in a wedding. or I'm. Maybe he continued on to the wedding and phoned the police from there. Again, he does not know that a homicide has taken place and a double double homicide at that. He would, in fact, though, provide details to police so that they could put together a composite a composite sketch of the suspect. He described the man as white, five feet seven inches to five feet eight inches tall, about 150 pounds, with reddish colored or light colored hair and a stubble beard. Police on the scene found Patricia Majors dead and Patricia Smith was mortally wounded more than an hour later, again, when the customer called 911 to say that he had seen an armed man approaching the store. Well, all the victims are roughly in the same age range. Correct. Patricia Smith was taken to St. Joseph Hospital where she was pronounced dead on arrival. There we have, unfortunately, her father, Bob Trendle, who said, I touched her hand as she lay there on the table. He's recalling the minutes after he arrived at the hospital. 
Her husband said, quote, I was expecting Trish was her nickname. I was expecting Trish home at 615 that night. I waited and she didn't show up. Norman Smith said, quote, I thought maybe she had a late customer. So I called the store and there was no answer. Smith said he tried calling again around 7 p.m., but when no one picked up, he knew something was wrong. Police interviewed both victims' husbands, Norman Smith and Mark Majors, after they each drove to the crime scene that Saturday evening, but quickly concluded that neither was connected to the slayings. Mark Majors said he reopened the bridal shop shortly after the murders, only to sell it five months later. He never remarried. He said of his wife, we had an absolute textbook marriage. We were best friends. So it sucked. <laughs> textbook. It was a textbook marriage. Yeah, there you go. He's saying that it actually took him about 13 years to fully accept and get through the grieving process, yeah. but he never really moved on. He said he harbors no ill feelings toward law enforcement for not catching Patricia's killer. This should not be a spoiler alert to anybody out there. This is not a spoiler because we said in the trailer, this is an unidentified serial killer that we're working with, that we're talking about here today. Now, after 26 years, Bob Trendle, father of Patricia Smith, said that he did not expect Patricia's murderer to be found in his lifetime. 26 years after the fact, he's saying this to the papers. And unfortunately, Robert William Bob Trendle of Topeka, formerly of Wichita, passed away on March 15th, 2018. Well, the problem that they're working against is the randomness. And if we believe that these two are connected, now we have miles upon miles and cities upon cities where this individual could come from. Yes. We first started off in Indianapolis, Indiana, and our second case is taking us all the way to Wichita, Kansas. So let's talk about the location of this store. It's located at 4613 East Kellogg Drive, Wichita, Kansas. And according to my maps and directions, it's one hour, 17 minutes drive to Salina. Now, Salina is the most direct location where I-70 intersects. It's 93 miles via 135 north. Or, and I'm going to throw this in as an aside because I'm having, going through this case, the city of Topeka, Kansas comes up several times uh, in this case. So I'm going to throw this out there too. You could go up I-35 to Topeka, Kansas. This is a two-hour, 136-mile drive to Topeka, Kansas, and I-70 runs right through Topeka. It's also 10 hours away from Indianapolis. That be correct, my friend. Let's go 16 days later, two weeks and two days later on April 27th, 1992. We have 40-year-old Michael Milo McCown, better known to his friends as Mick, he is working, and he will be working in his mother's store. This is called Sylvia's Ceramics Shop, located at 2615 South 3rd Street in Terre Haute, Indiana. We're back in the Hoosier State, Captain. He is the only male to be killed in any of this series of attacks. Now, prior to starting at the ceramic shop with his wife, Sylvia, Mick's father owned a barber shop. This was called Phil's Barber Shop for 20 years in the same location. It was shortly before the murder that it transitioned from the barber shop to this ceramics store. Investigators believe that the killer chose this store because the store's solo woman's name. Sylvia's ceramics. So if in fact this killer is seeking targets, seeking stores that are being operated by a single solo worker, female worker, this, the sign 
on the store in front of the store indicates that that might be what this killer would find once he enters the store. A woman working solo. But what else do we know about this individual? About About McCown? About his surveillance of these areas that he's going to rob and potentially murder somebody. Well, let's let's continue on. Through Hold on the- a second. This is a good point. We have eyewitnesses that saw him um, stalking or peeping Tom or whatever you want to call it, running surveillance on, on his first location from across the street. So, again, maybe he picked this location because it's a single... A single female name, but even if he was watching the store from a distance, there's a the son. I believe he has pretty long hair for a male, and so it's possible if he was running surveillance on his next target, he wouldn't have known it was a man from a distance. Yes, and that's part of the investigators theory on this particular case in the series is that (coughs) McCown uh, or Mick, he had long hair and wore a ponytail and he was also a smaller guy. So it's believed that if in fact the killer was watching the store, if in fact he could see this man from outside of the store through a window or a glass door, that if he only saw this man from the back, that he may have believed it was a woman working by herself. Again, that goes to the idea of the name on the sign itself Mm -hmm. that would indicate a small business, a small store operated by owner-operated store. He might be expecting to find Sylvia inside working that day. Again, though, I think... um Law enforcement knows this, and and but just to kind of state the obvious, they're picking places where you know the register is not going to be filled. It's not going to be a big score financially, right? But you are going to get a score of of some kind, right? It's the trade off that you were talking about earlier. If you want to make a whole bunch of money, you go rob the McDonald's that has served a billion Big Macs that day. Mm-hmm. But you're going to encounter five or six employees in the store and probably several customers at the same time. You walk into Sylvia's ceramic shop, mm-hmm. how much money are you expecting to get? But you're also- A couple hundred bucks, maybe. Yeah, you're also expecting, you know what? I can watch the store for 15, 20 minutes and, and determine that there are no customers inside the store. I'm only thinking I'm going to encounter one employee. Right. Now, the investigators went as far, and they seem pretty firm on this, so I don't know exactly Did you grab them? how they've pieced this together, mm-hmm. but they seem pretty firm on this idea that, that Mick very likely never saw his killer, and they believe that the killer may not have seen the front of Mick or his face until after he had already killed the man. This This shot in the back of the head thing, too, has to be something right yes that that it's it's always the same way like yes like that that maybe that means they know what they're doing is wrong well you wonder is he too cowardly to have to look them in the face right before or during the killing you know you, you also think it makes sense too we've seen this several times in other cases where the customers or employees inside a store during a robbery are taken to the back room. They get on their knees and they're shot in the back of the head. That's not terribly uncommon. Right. And that is Again, what they the believe took the place room. at the bridal shop. Suck it. Nope. Not going to the back of the room. Well, it's, <clears throat> it may be get shot here, or get shot in the back of the room. I don't know. These are, these are horrible situations. Hopefully. And I pray none of us, here or none of us listening ever find ourselves in such situations. Yeah, but the more and more we cover these cases, you know, get in the car, don't get in the car, get in the van, don't get in the van. You know, let me tie you up. Don't let them tie you up. Hey, let's play this little magic trick with some handcuffs. Don't do that. You know, it's it's almost like 
we see time and time again the ones don't, that don't follow d- directions almost throw the killer off their game because they're expecting these people. I got a gun. They're gonna they're gonna listen to what I say. I'm I'm powerful. The problem with that though is with that analysis is the the people that don't survive aren't there to tell us exactly right. what went down, That's especially true. when we have a killer who gets away. They may they may not have agreed or or gone along with any part of it and ended up right right You're the right. same you know it's it's regardless it's 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 sad. I'm man. still going with my idea that you asked me to do something. Suck it. Let's just get this done and over with. You know. I'm not going to be put somewhere to be tortured. Right. Or you're not going to tie me up while you torture somebody else. But the best advice that you've given is that don't get in a car. Don't, if you're already outside, don't go in a place that's not outside. Right. Stay as close to the public or outside as you possibly can. Okay. This is, this is strange because strange. we have the investigators who are very firm on the idea that Mick never saw his killer that the killer likely never saw Mick's face until after he had already shot him. They say that there is everything to indicate that Mick was reaching for a small white ceramic house on a shelf when he was shot at close range in the back of the head. This is curious for a couple of reasons. One, could you have a situation where he's busy just stocking a shelf or moving things around, going about his normal business his normal daily routine mm-hmm. and the killer comes into, this is a small store comes into the small store, you know, mixes just one minute. I'll be right with you. Right. And before he can turn around, boom shot to the back of the head. Or is this a situation where the killer came in, maybe had the gun concealed and needed just enough time to pull out the gun said, Hey, I would like to look at this item or could you, Hand, you know, how can I help you, sir? Could you hand me that? And he turns around, and then he shot. So I don't know well, I why think the, the cu- pl- right, but I think the customer ruse trick makes so much sense because you could you learn so much about the store within minutes of being inside, and even if another customer came in, you just have to wait them out. So you you would know that the store was empty. Most of these stores have little dingers on the door. So you would know if somebody else came in and you would get the lay of the land real quickly or within a a couple questions like we were saying before Mm -hmm. to know that this individual is by by themselves. And you would think after the the last attack, if in fact the killer really wants to only walk into a situation or kill in a situation where there's just one employee working – that maybe they go in under the ruse of being a customer to confirm right that's, that in yeah. fact that there's nobody else in the in the building itself i don't know how much i believe that that the killer never saw mick's face or that mick never saw the killer i i again we don't know what information the police have to kind of sound like they're pretty firm on this idea mm-hmm. i question this for several reasons because what i think we're dealing with here captain and i've i've not really been good at hiding this for at all because i don't want to i don't know that i think that robbery is the primary motive here i see a series of killings where it sounds to me and looks to me like killing might be the motivation might be what this guy is after and the robbery is just something that takes place during this goal of killing. I don't think if, and if that in fact is true, there's no reason for me to believe that this guy walks into this little store and all of a sudden discovers, Oh, it's a man working and not a woman. And then walks out. That's a possibility. But I think we're dealing with a guy that once he's made up his mind, he's going to strike. He strikes. So what we have here is we have Mick McCown is shot once in the back of the head with a 22 caliber gun. The there was still a small amount of money in the register. So again, the robbery motive is very weird here. But McCown's wallet was gone. However, police found $15 in McCown's pocket. So the killer took the time to take the wallet, 
but didn't check the pockets. Mm. His body was discovered by a customer around 4.15 p.m. The investigation seemed futile. It was as if a ghost had walked in, shot the man, and then left, leaving no trace of himself behind. It was virtually, and this is coming from the words of the investigators on this case, it was virtually a cold case before the end of the week. The killer walks in, boom, kills the guy, leaves no evidence behind, and walks out and leaves. They've got nothing to work with. Well, and it doesn't take, I was just thinking about this, I mean, if you go to these even small towns to find a location where there's a strip mall or whatever, it wouldn't take you long to, I mean... A couple passes up and down the strip mall to to see who's working, who's not working, what store has a lot of people, what store seems very not you know not busy during that time. Well, and if you've mastered your ruse as a customer, as you and I keep kind of hinting toward, you may not even have to watch the store at all. You walk in, and if it's not what you want, maybe you leave. Right. You know, it's 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 again, it's one of those situations. I do believe, though, if the if everything seems right to this guy, once he decides to strike, he strikes. Now, the thing that might turn him off or the thing that might make him abort this mission is walking in and finding himself in a busy store. But if you're in front of a small storefront, a small store, mm-hmm. and there's one car or no cars, mm-hmm. you got a pretty good idea what's going on inside those walls. Yeah, or or you don't like this situation. It's as simple as... Oh, I forgot my wallet or you guys have a nice day and you, you walk away. Your store sucks. <laughs> right. Walk out. I, I believe that if they would took this composite, which eventually they have and, and they start connecting these cases together, that if they would ask about other other stores, if they saw this individual in their store, they might get lucky with some eyewitnesses. You Let- know, going into other stores and it not being a place that he wanted to be involved with. Or again, you know, we have evidence that this guy is stalking his target. And I think it wouldn't be that hard from a distance to get a lay of the land. The location as with the others will be important. This small store was located at 2615 South third street in Terre Haute, Indiana, This was just a two-minute drive, 0.9 miles from Interstate 70. If you're ever curious what, what we look like, what the colonel looks like, what the captain looks like, what any of these cast of characters in the episodes look like you can follow us on Instagram because we post all that information there at True Crime Garage. Join us tomorrow. Back here in the garage. We'll see you then. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.